What's up, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Dumbro Podcast. Today, I have a very, very special guest with me, somebody I've been speaking to for a while, trying to get on my show for a while. And uh, finally, here we are. We have him on the show. Most of you are going to know who Max Blumenthal is. And if you do, you're probably surprised he's coming on my little lowly show here because he's used to being on some pretty major national news networks. But here we are. In case you don't know who he is, he's an award-winning author, journalist, and documentary filmmaker. He has a new book out called The Management of Savagery, which I've recently finished, and that is one of the things we're going to be talking about. So without further ado, let's jump right into the discussion. There we go. I finally have you on the line. You're a difficult guy to get a hold of, man. The, uh... I, got, I got work to do, but uh, you know, the one night that I it, it planned to um, come on, I had a friend who'd been in town, and I thought he left, and he came back, and had to, <laughs> he was trying to tow his truck back up to Jersey City with a U-Haul, and it didn't work, and I had to go pick him up, and it was just completely oh uh, that's okay you know things happen i didn't have much time that day anyways because i had to uh fly out to chengdu to look at some rvs right and right. that was a you know something i've never heard anyone say to me before in uh you know left-wing online media is i got to go check out an rv show <laughs> <laughs> anyways just jumping right into things so i i actually should say that i found out about your stuff quite late uh quite late because it was the um, NED documentary you did that was, I think, one of your later pieces of work. Was that last year that you put that together? I think uh, it was 2018, probably early 2018. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that was good. So that's what caught my attention. And then, of course, you have your new book, The uh, Management of Savagery, which I finished. It's a big book, but lots of really um, interesting things in there. It really uh, it consumed me, takes a deep dive into kind of American foreign policy and propaganda. But actually, before we talk a little bit about that, I wanted to find out a little bit about what kind of drives you, because you've got an interesting approach where, you you know, one moment it seems like you're criticizing one side and then the other, and it doesn't seem like you really take sides per se. And I'm sure that people do try to fit you in a box. And it's probably hard to uh, put you in one because you're not even afraid to offend your core audience at times. So I just want to find out, like, what's your general kind of principle, strategy, approach, and what kind of drives you um, in when you're kind of planning out your work and doing your work? I mean, with the management of savagery, it's a profile or a survey of the bipartisan foreign policy consensus <clears throat> and all the damage that it's done uh, and around the world, but ultimately to Western liberal democracy and how it kind of culminated with President Trump and the rise of you know, the far right in Europe, which have existed outside of the consensus. Um, you know, they always are looking for Russia to blame or all of these um, you know, boogeymen and ghosts, magical forces. But the reality is that, you know, if these if this sort of opaque, unelected force that, you know, people who support Trump call the deep state what I call the national security state, you could call it the permanent war state. It really is a state within a state that's unelected, unaccountable, almost unknown to most people in this country. Um, they should look in the mirror because they're responsible for this crisis that the right. world is in. And so I kind of lay it out starting in 1979 in Afghanistan. For me, it's sort of a chronicle of my own life and my generation. I think all of my books uh, function in the, sort of in, in that respect personally. Um, my first book was about um, the Bush era and the far right takeover of the Republican Party, mainly the Christian right, the religious right. Um, and this is a force that came into American life when I was very young in the early 1980s. And so they're, they they reached the apex of their power under George W. Bush. They're a major force within Trump's coalition. My second book, Goliath, Life and Loathing in Greater Israel, was about um, Israel-Palestine and Israel, really the, the, the consolidation of right-wing control over Israel and the lifting of the mask 
of you know this phony idea of Israeli democracy or the state being Jewish and democratic, um, and really <clears throat> fascism or a kind of fascism coming yeah. out the forefront of Israeli life. And for me, I'm Jewish. Uh, I was raised in Washington D.C., where you know you're not indoctrinated in a really forceful way, but to be Jewish, you uh, are going to have Israel put in your face. And so growing up for me, a big part of my political formation was to see Israel carry out these catastrophic wars and uh, repression campaigns against Palestinians and against Lebanon, starting with the first intifada when I was 10 years old, then the second intifada when I was really politically coming of age, um, seeing the Janine refugee camp get destroyed right after I'd gone on this free birthright trip to Israel, then... Uh, the um, second Lebanon war where Israel just bombarded, carpet bombed Southern Lebanon and Southern Beirut. Um, then, you know, the brutal wars of annihilation in the Gaza Strip from 2009 to 2014. Um, the third of those assaults was the subject for a book I wrote, The 51 Day War, which was my third book. And it's where I met uh, someone you previously interviewed, Dan Cohen. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, we went into Gaza together and we produced this documentary over the course of the next three years called Killing Gaza. Um, and, you know, he went through a similar formation as I did, you know, arriving at anti-Zionism just by witnessing this this history. Um, and right. so the last book was sort of, it was really my statement on um, the U.S.'s role in the world um, and specifically relating to Syria and the Middle East, um, how the U.S. has weaponized. I mean, I, I also grew up in, in the post 9-11 era. And, you know, we all dealt with that around the world. But in the U.S., that was what spurred the rise of Islamophobia, the war on sort of Muslim civil society in the U.S. and this hysteria about Muslim terror. And, you know, once you look behind the surface and you really uh, investigate the roots of 9-11, you see that it, it, its roots lay in the U.S. actually using Salafi jihadi forces as a geopolitical weapon against its enemies. Um, Afghanistan, of course, led to the rise of al-Qaeda. Uh, the U.S. did it in, in Chechnya, uh, all across Central Asia, the Balkans, and ultimately in Syria with this yeah. multi-billion dollar arm and equip campaign called um, Operation Timber Sycamore. And I was you know, viciously attacked uh, starting in 2016 for really coming out against that whole operation, including by many of the allies and friends I'd made in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. So that book was sort of an attempt to put that whole era and my own point of view about the rise of Trump, about Syria, about US foreign policy, in a historical context. That book was different from the other three because while it did involve a lot of uh, firsthand reporting, including, you know, co I, I covered a, um, a neo-Nazi rally in, in Helsinki. So, you know, lots of reporting from Europe and some reporting from the Middle East and of course back home, but much of it was just a, you know, a chronicle. Of right the last 30 years or so. Well, you, you know, it was interesting though, because in your book in the beginning um, or during the first parts when you start speaking about Trump, it almost seemed like there was a glimmer of hope, uh, ironically or not, if, 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 if you call it ironic, but the um, that Trump was the most likely candidate to go against that kind of uh, pro-war establishment. It looked like there was kind of uh, uh, hope for things to change in terms of the um, th that side of things. And um, he even kind of ran on that platform. I think in the book you mentioned he was one of the first presidents to openly criticize what the U.S. was doing in uh, certain areas. And um, originally, uh, I, 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 potentially beforehand, that might have been political suicide, but it ended up working in his favor because it seems like people underestimated the um, anti-war sentiment that was growing across the general population. Um, so in the beginning, it seemed like there was a little bit of hope that there could have been change in terms of those aspects. Um, and and um, in that regard, um, am I, first of all, have I interpreted that correctly? And, uh, and then the follow-up question is, how do you think he's done in terms of living up to that potential expectation? That's a really good question. 
Uh, from my point of view, there wasn't a hope that Trump would change anything, but there was an anticipation of a confrontation. And I thought that that would be po a positive confrontation. It would sharpen a lot of the contradictions where you have this uh, vast mass of American people, whether they're on the right or on the left, who really despise what has been done around the world in their names. And then you have this elite in the media, academia, think tanks, and particularly in our political structure and military intelligence apparatus that wants to continue this project that's just brought so much ruin um, at home and abroad. And Trump was really bringing it out. Um, he was speaking a language that I think resonated with many of the people in middle America who suffered, if not the physical injury, then the moral injury of participating in the post 9-11 wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, who hated the Bush family, who hated the neocons, who had been lied to and came back home with their minds, lives, and possibly parts of their bodies destroyed if they came back at all. Actually, I, you know, and I've met people just randomly who participated in those wars who were like shells of people uh, because they committed war crimes and they would tell me about what they did and how they were staving off suicide. Trump spoke to that in a way no other major candidate had, more than Bernie Sanders even did, um, and particularly when he humiliated Jeb Bush on national TV. I, mean, I was just blown away when he did that. And I know so many people on the left who were just like high-fiving when Trump finally delivered that blow. But of course it was not to be, but Trump wasn't going to rout the deep state and bring us to this isolationist Pat Buchanan style foreign policy. Uh, he wasn't going to be able to uh, have detente with Russia and start, uh, you know, a series of new missile treaties, for example, and rolling back NATO, which is this useless permanent war alliance that began in the North Atlantic, but now exists all over the world and is increasingly focused on China. None of that was going to happen. I wasn't surprised. Trump was sort of a mentally febrile character who, you know, was able to sense things politically in an animalistic way that other career politicians weren't. But as a executive uh, was easily rolled and Russiagate was the main instrument for rolling Trump. I don't know if you remember when Donald Trump, I, I wrote about this in the afterword of um, the management of savagery. The first time Trump bombed Syria over one of these really dubious uh, reports of a chemical attack, this one in Khan Sheikhoun in Idlib, uh, Donald, I think it was Eric Trump, uh, rushed to the press to declare that Trump uh, bombing Syria, an ally of Russia, proved that Donald Trump was no friend. <laughs> oh, yes, I remember seeing, seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like this over constant overcompensation. And, you know, Michael Flynn gets removed as national security uh, director. So then you bring in H.R. McMaster, who comes straight from you know, the military and that awful arms industry funded think tank world on K Street. And then you replace him with John Bolton and look at the position Donald Trump is in right now, where he's saying oh, Don Bolton wants to bomb the whole world, but he's going to find out now what it feels to, like to have bombs dropped on him. Why did yeah. you hire him? You know, this, you're, he blew up your whole Korea summit. Like everything is, it is just we're, yeah, that, that, we're more on a hair trigger now than we were before Trump. So. Yeah, yeah. That, that was interesting to see, though, because when you saw, uh, and, uh, and you highlighted this in your NED documentary also, when you saw Trump trying to improve relations with North Korea or open up dialogue, there was almost a system in the background that went to work right away to kind of undo whatever he was working on there. You know, the uh, uh, the, the so-called you know human rights activists and everybody coming out with all these stories. Um so that was quite interesting to see. And it really highlights within this in the government, yeah. like actually within the federal government. I mean, that's remarkable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. That was um, that was interesting. Um, now, so one of the things you were talking about was the propaganda and you were talking about the um, anti kind of Muslim propaganda that was going on um, after 9-11. And we we spoke about this a little bit. I, I feel like there's so many parallels with what's going on with because uh, obviously you know I'm living in China and a lot of my content is China focused. But I feel like 
a lot of the same systems and mechanics are going into place to now start a campaign against China. I, obviously, I don't think it's going to end the same way, but we were talking about this, you know, weapons of mass destruction idea of turning uh, the COVID-19 into something that came uh, for, you know, as a deliberately uh, designed item. You've got the uh, Epic Times being delivered to all of the homes around America, Australia and Canada with re some really extreme anti-Chinese propaganda in it. And I think if I remember correctly, you were saying there was one point there were DVD mailers that went out to everybody with anti-Muslim content on it. I don't know if that was uh, it was uh, if it was Breitbart or or one of the one, one of those yeah groups. Right and, and, yeah. So do you do you feel like you're seeing a lot of those same mechanisms being used now in this kind of anti-China propaganda that we're seeing? Definitely, definitely. I mean, I wrote in my book about how I think it was you know the 2008 election where Obama had been um, assigned with this secret Muslim identity by the right. Uh, John McCain was the candidate. McCain didn't want anything to do with that kind of politics, but the right was running its own campaign in parallel to the McCain campaign. And, you know, they had Sarah Palin within his campaign. So she was sort of the proxy for the neocons and the Islamophobes and the, the Daniel Pipes characters. And I think it, it was called a Clarion Institute. I mean, my, my memory is a little rusty and it was a video a DVD that was mailed out about the threat of radical Islam in the U S government and the Muslim brotherhood penetrating U S government. And of course it went to Obama. And I remember actually uh, I was out on the campaign trail, staying in some hotel and it, it, it arrived with my USA today or some local paper. It was just stuffed in there, a DVD, you know, I mean, <laughs> DVDs, they cost a few dollars to produce, but every newspaper was stuffed with one in every swing state in the U S. So, a lot of money was going into this. It was from like the right wing pro Israel billionaires who wound up supporting Trump. And now you have this anti China campaign. I mean, it, these, these, these campaigns, they, so, they serve dual purposes. First, they, it's like Russia Gate. You know, Russia Gate was created by the Hillary Clinton and DNC dead enders on the one hand. But on the other hand, it's John Brennan and the intelligence apparatus. And they each had different interests. Okay, all of them hated Trump, but the Hillary people just wanted to get revenge on Trump. The intelligence apparatus, the FBI, they're trying to justify their, their budgets and increase their budgets. And so they need a Cold War to justify their own existence. And beyond that, these are guys who were in Vietnam. They're just anti-communist hardliners. That's all they think about. Yeah, they're just, yeah. They're, 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 so, they're, they're, their eyes are up to blood. So it's the same with the right, you know, with this China campaign. It's like they're going to try to use China against Biden. I think Hunter Biden did some consulting for a Chinese company. But they also really want the new Cold War. And you have Steve Bannon out there um, with this um, Chinese exile billionaire. Miles Call, Miles Call yeah. Yeah. And he's trying to start a parallel government. It's like the right wing's version of uh, Chop or Chaz in Seattle, but it's the parallel. Oh yeah, those, those guys. Um, so Miles, uh, so Steve Bannon and Miles Guo, they were on camera um, directing, like they were sending commands to the Hong Kong protests on a live stream. Steve Bannon was standing next to him, and then and then another, the next stream was um, Miles Guo having a discussion with uh, a guy named Bagio uh, Bag Liang in uh, Hong Kong, who's the leader of the National Front Party. And he said to him, this Miles Gould guy said, we're going to give you all the support we need. Uh, Steve Bannon is going to give you all the support you need. We're going to give you all the financing you need. And, and I don't know whether that meant government or, or Miles Gould directly. But then within a couple of weeks of that live stream, uh, Baggio Leung was arrested in connection with one of the largest explosive hauls in all of Hong Kong's history. Um, like the stuff that these guys are doing, it's pretty crazy. But um, but it's interesting to hear you talk about. So yeah, the, before the campaigning or, or how to uh, attack your political opponent before was finding out how connected they were to Islam. And now it's uh, a, a matter of how connected are you to uh, China? And yeah. you even saw that in the campaign commercials where it basically looked like it was a competition between Biden and Trump in terms of who's going to hate China more. Um, to prove their 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 worthiness, the Russian um, uh, link is quite interesting too because I, I like the thing that you pointed out in your book with um, 
how so many so-called Russian bots were removed off of the uh, internet. And they couldn't, in the end, figure out, like, were these really bots? They found, like, a British pensioner or some just ordinary people who were removed off the internet. And it was the Atlantic uh, Council, I believe you're saying, who was involved with removing some of these accounts off of Facebook. And when you look at who they're involved with, you know, arms industries, all this other kind of stuff, it's like, this is a pretty big conflict of interest. And this latest um, removal of Chinese bots uh, was you had uh, you had the um, the victims of communism memorial fund um, who was involved in a lot of the narrative around these Chinese bots being removed and I'm sure you know quite a bit about them they count uh, Nazi deaths as uh, victims of communism uh, right. when they when when the Soviets defeated them they were gonna they were gonna I, at the last I heard they were gonna add COVID nineteen deaths to the list of communism related deaths also um, <laughs> so it's pretty crazy what's going on and it's just happening over and over again and it seems like it's it seems kind of frustrating that people don't just wake up and and say that okay you know what we've been you know obviously the big one was the you know weapons of mass destruction but people don't seem to be uh saying eventually okay hold on a second we've been through this before but with your content are you noticing um, because I almost felt like that story you said about Trump in terms of him running on an anti-war platform and it ending up working for him even though traditionally that probably shouldn't have worked before are you finding a shift at all where people are becoming a little bit more open-minded to your content and willing to listen uh to what you have to say about what's really going uh, on underneath the covers or it's pretty much still kind of working against the grain uh as much as ever it really uh i really do feel a shift since uh we launched the gray zone or i launched it as a completely independent entity that left alternate i've just seen a huge growth in our audience and our regular hits in the amount of uh, attention and engagement we're getting on our youtube videos we we broke a uh, hundred thousand subscribers in one year last december um so clearly something's happening out there because we're really consistent we're not like the intercept where you don't know what any what which writer believes what or and they are all fighting with each other over certain things and Glenn Greenwald's the one who really kind of stands out as the most consistent. We, we we're, we're, it's obvious what we represent at the gray zone, what our brand is, what our message is, and people are turning to it. Um, and we have a growing audience in Latin America because we translate a lot of our content into Spanish. Um, right. I, I yeah, think yeah. This is, uh, you know, just a sign of the times, you know, it was much harder in 2017 to talk about Russia Gate, I remember talking about it and just being blitzkrieged with attacks and seeing how alarmed all these liberals who had previously been sympathetic to my work were um, the amount of intent, not just antagonism, but sort of um, marginalization I got, you know, as blacklisted within the within, within certain circles for opposing the US proxy war on Syria. Um, it's, it just feels like there's much less resistance right now because we've proven our point again and again and again through factual journalism and through these various sagas kind of playing out where you eventually see Russiagate completely falling apart through the Mueller, you know, old man Mueller, uh, unable to even form thoughts while testifying in his report finding no collusion. Uh, the Duma episode in Syria where these whistleblowers emerge from within the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, stating that they were involved on the ground in the investigation of the supposed chemical attack, which, which triggered U.S. airstrikes, and that no such chemical attack occurred, that it was staged, and that the so-called Syrian white helmets were involved in the staging. I mean, these, you know, you have professionals within international agencies who are saying what we had been saying for years. And so other people see that and they say, okay, maybe these guys weren't just crazy conspiracists. What we really get now in terms of opposition are like professional opponents. Um, I, I don't know to what extent they're working for or with the U.S. government. I, I have a feeling some of them are but they basically are sicked on us. It's like they're contract killers or mercenaries that are just, and I'm sure they believe in what they do, but they're just like a few characters who are obsessed with us. And what they tried to do is what the uh, right tried to do to Obama or what, uh, you know, the 
center left and the intelligence spooks like Brennan and Comey and others tried to do to Trump, which is to just link us to evil doing foreign powers and to try to insinuate that we're just being secretly backed by all of these evil doing governments. Yeah, that I mean, that's interesting when you because talking about them believing in what they do. That's always been an interesting thing I've thought about also in terms of um, these people who are kind of um, taking this propaganda for face value or repeating it. Um, I always do wonder if um, they truly believe what they're doing or if they know deep down inside that maybe the U.S. isn't a, a force for good when it comes to their foreign policy, but they uh, know that it's a matter of kind of uh, retaining power or whatever it is, and they're willingly doing this. I mean, it's it's obviously clear that people weren't mostly interested in the in the truth. I remember your interview with, um, I think it was Jamie Raskin, when you were calling him out on something he said about RT, and you 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 kept asking him, and because he said um, you were saying, well, he said but that's Robert not Stone that's, had a show on RT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Roger Stone, and then he 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 kept saying, but he didn't have a show on RT. He's like, but he appeared on RT. He's like, but he didn't have a show on RT. And then he just kind of blew up, and he's like, I don't understand what you're doing. And basically, his response was more or less saying that, why do you care about the truth? This lie is more important than the truth. Um, so, <laughs> and and that's what I I encounter all of the time. And I just wonder if like if somebody was to say to you and say, okay you know what, Max, just be quiet because this is where the U.S. gets their power. This is why we're so rich. This is why we're so prosperous. And we know what we're doing is wrong, but we're going to keep doing it. I wonder how many people actually think that. Or do people um, really think that they're, they're kind of doing something good for the world? Um, I don't know if you have any kind of ideas on that, about the mindset about people that either simply believe this or uh, assist in pushing it forward. Yeah, I, that's, I, I forgot about that episode with Raskin, but I really think he didn't know shit and just thought this is what I'm supposed to do to get Trump and we need to get Trump because you know the, Trump is the most evil thing in the world. Trump is Hitler. He's a fascist. So who cares if we're stretching the truth a little bit? We got to pin this on him. Uh, but Raskin went even further than that. This is a constitutional lawyer whose father um, was his name, Maurice Raskin. He founded IPS, the Institute for Policy Studies, which was the first left-wing think tank in Washington, okay. uh, it was the first anti-war think tank in Washington. And here's Jamie Raskin at this insane Russiagate rally in 2017. And he's uh, he, he not only said all of this stuff about Trump being in bed with Russia and the people around Trump being in bed with Russia, he said that Putin is... Um, is, is overseeing an axis of authoritarianism from Duterte's Philippines to Assad, Syria, to uh, Orban's Hungary, to the, the, all these places, oh, to uh, Maduro's Venezuela. And I said, you do favor regime change in all those places? And he said, yes. And I'm, <laughs> this is a perfect example of like the, the, de the decay that this hyper liberal uh, cold, new cold war mentality has promoted. I, I can't imagine his, his father thinking that way, but you know, he wants to be a big man in Washington. So I ran, I actually ran into him at a party, like a kind of cocktail party, um, in Washington that was an event where it was a group of people who, I mean, you could call them kind of Washington elites, but a lot of them were former national security professionals, many former state department people, uh, who and and you know journalists and writers who were really just disgusted with the direction of U.S. foreign policy, and they'd kind of come together and formed this semi underground group. Um, and they held they hold various events or what you would call salons or whatever, where they'll have a a writer speak to them about their book or you know someone interesting, talk about a historical figure. And and, and Raskin was invited um, because the group was trying to court him as an ally on a few initiatives because he wasn't 100% bad on foreign policy. And when he saw me, he just launched into this tirade and started screaming at me and he demanded that I apologize. He said, you should apologize. I said, for what? You got up there and lied and called for a new Cold War. You should apologize. And he was livid. He wouldn't let me speak. It was, it was insane, like the, 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 just how unhinged he was. Uh, and wow. he was leaving the party screaming and everyone was really uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, <laughs> basically, a lot, you know, this group, they were trying to get things done in Congress to get, um, you know, their main obsession was with the AUMF to sunset the uh, AUMF so that 
that basically emergency law ended and the U.S. would end its uh, authorization for the use of military force, which is like permanent right now. And one of the people associated with the group after, you know, months later, after everyone was so uncomfortable about that exchange, he said, you know, we couldn't get shit done with Raskin. He wasn't interested in doing anything. And I said, I told you, you know, and that's the way Congress is now. You have all of these, this new class of liberals who come from a very progressive background. They're very progressive domestically, but they won't do shit on foreign policy. And they're just so malleable when it comes to the national security state. Uh, which incentivizes them to behave in this neoconservative fashion. Um, right. Yeah. It seems like the whole system is kind of set up, uh, set up for that. I, th I think those kinds of encounters, though, I mean, the one that you showed where uh, those are really important also to kind of wake people up to think, OK, hold on a second, because essentially that's what he said was that the lies are more important when you believe in something. And um, there was another thing you did that kind of. Um, was similar to that, but I'll, fir I'll first say, you know, I, I like the idea of these laying down these little kind of epiphany moments for people. And, uh, you know, the one for me personally, uh, that stood out was when I was younger and I watched the, um, it was, it was a debate between uh, Ron Paul and Rudy Giuliani and some other candidates that were on stage. And I don't know if you ever remember this. He, uh, uh Ron Paul said, we should really ask the question, why were we attacked on 9-11? Do you think it's just because we, they hate our freedom? It's like maybe it has something to do with what we're doing overseas. And then Rudy Giuliani, um, he basically snapped back at him. He said, I lived through the 9-11 attacks. I've heard some pretty ridiculous things said, and that's the most preposterous thing I've ever heard. And the whole audience cheered. The whole audience cheered for the idea that Ron Paul shouldn't be asking these questions about why was America attacked? And that was the moment for me when I started really thinking a little bit different when I'm thinking, okay, something's not right here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if you remember. Did you watch that or do you remember I, I that? Do. back I, mean, then? I remember Ron Paul was one of the few candidates who staged an intervention in the uh, bipartisan foreign policy consensus before Trump. I mean, you had Howard Dean opposing the Iraq war because right. know, the Democratic base opposed the war. But Ron yeah. Paul was really going deep into the part of the issue. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that uh, it probably was kind of political suicide for him. It, it wasn't something you could do back then. And uh, hopefully well, not, we're getting- not entirely. I mean, he was a minor candidate who's previously unknown from a uh, backwater district in Texas who okay. uh, wound up winning a lot of votes. If you look at, the, for example, the South Carolina primary, Ron Paul swept all the military base communities, all the communities with military bases. Those guys all voted for Ron Paul. He kind of oh, so they they liked what he was saying in that regard. Yeah, I mean, he, if you Ron Paul's still going, and his little political empire is built on those campaigns. He galvanized a section of the country into a kind of libertarian movement that has um, cross partisan appeal. Right. Right, right, yeah. It's like Tulsi um, Gabbard, you know, she kind of ran a similar campaign, but I don't think she's going to go as far as him. I don't know what she's going to do now. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Um, but on to kind of these little moments that make people think. Um, it, it, the, 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 the one that I really, really like too, and I've reposted it on Twitter quite a few times, was um, it was in your NED documentary, and it was when you were speaking to Onar, Omar Kanat from the, the World Uyghur uh, Congress. Yeah. And you were asking specifically about these kinds of, uh, the numbers that they have about 1 million or 2 million people detained. And um, if you watch the, your whole movie, you didn't put the two clips together, but in the beginning he says the media gets their information from him, from groups like his. Yeah, yeah. And then you asked him where he gets his information from. And he says, well, we get our information from the media. And it seemed like it was an <laughs> endless loop without any source. And uh, I, so that was a good epiphany moment. But what I want to ask you is because when I saw that, I literally said, what? I like yelled at what? How, how could you give an answer like that? But you were so calm and collected and cool. You were just like, you repeated what he said. You said Western media estimates. <laughs> and yeah, I mean it, <laughs> Does it take does it take effort to really just stay cool? Or is that just your personality where you're like, OK, buddy? <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, it's a style for sure. And it's something that I perfected. I was one of the first journalists to start doing kind of independent YouTube uh, reports and mini documentaries. And that was part of my style was to 
um, not prov- to just ask direct questions of people and they would tend to say extremely insane shit. For example, if they were at a Christian Zionist convention that I ask, are you looking forward to the apocalypse? And you got to, if you start laughing and just breaking down and, and like rolling on the floor, they're going to stop telling you what they really think. So you just have to keep a poker face up and nod your head. That's- yeah, that's just standard that's, interview tactics, and it's also a show of respect for the person. That's like these are your views, and I'm going to listen to you say what you say. Yeah, I guess that would be that's a really good way to ha- get be have the most conduciveness to get an actual answer. Of course, it doesn't always work because I remember um, you were in you were in a, some sort of a a conference hall, and there was a guy who was also pushing the Uyghur story, the Xinjiang uh, propaganda. It's a guy from Germany or something like that. Yeah, and you asked. Yeah, you 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 mentioned something like all the weird stuff he was writing in his book. And yeah, I asked, mean, yeah. Going back to Omar Khanat, like most people in the U.S. wouldn't think what he was saying was very crazy, but basically that was the end of this conference. And for those of you watching who don't know what the NED is, it's the National Endowment for Democracy. It's a group that was spun out of the CIA under Bill Casey and the Reagan administration. The point of it was to fund opposition movements and civil society and media in inside countries where the U.S. is seeking regime change. It is the spear point of the U.S. regime change machine and supporting the Uyghurs and the World Uyghur Congress specifically and all the different spinoff groups associated with it is a major priority because the U.S. wants to essentially break off the Xinjiang semi autonomous province from China and wants to weaponize minority groups within countries that it, uh, you know, whose government it doesn't like. So um, Omar Khanat has been heavily involved in constructing this idea of China as the new Nazi Germany holding millions of Uyghurs in concentration camps. And it was the first time I had a chance to really interrogate those numbers he was uh, just walking around this conference, which was mostly North Korean defectors and people who were um, p- putting out stories about North Korea being sort of the junior Nazi Germany in the world. And everybody was following Kanat around. He was like the man. I mean, he was really being treated as like the star of the NED. And so I wanted to know who he was. And I just mm-hmm. walked up to him and I said, hello, who are you? And he told me, he told me, and I said, oh, you're that guy. So where do these numbers come from? And he couldn't give me a straight, he couldn't give me a clear answer or one that I found plausible. And, you know, it's not like, you know, we're nickel and diming the Holocaust here. It's that something we knew that it happened and we're trying to minimize it. It's not like yeah. I'm denying that Uyghurs face repression or there isn't this mass surveillance complex in Xinjiang. It's that I'm trying to find out what the hell is going on? Because I haven't seen any evidence of all of these numbers and neither has anyone else. So then I went to uh, Congress more recently after we started really looking into uh, this story. And I was working with Ajit Singh, who's someone who I consider like the, one of the leading critics of U S China policy within um Western media. He's one yeah, of he's the, great. He's one of the few people who's willing to take on all of these propaganda constructs and just rip them to shreds, showing how there's really at the point when you just start opening the onion and peeling it back in the in the middle, there's just nothing but crap. There's like nothing there. There's no basis. Although, you know, there might be a basis to say China has exploited labor or something like that, or Uyghurs weren't treated so good, but they they make it just such an exaggeration that it falls apart once you start questioning it. So Ajit actually went into the sources of the millions of Uyghurs in concentration camps story and found that it all boiled down to two sources. One, Chinese human human rights defenders, which is a US government backed group of Chinese exiles that's based here in Washington. They actually share a building with Human Rights Watch. And in their report, they interviewed eight people from Xinjiang and extrapolated from the number of people in their villages, this statistic of anywhere from 250,000 to a million people in camps based on eight interviews. And then you have this German guy, this bonkers German end timer character named Adrian Zenz, who is a Christian evangelical who says that he's on a mission from God to take down the Chinese communist party. 
he wrote a book about the rapture and he's advocating in the book scriptural spanking of children. Uh, he hates homosexuals. He thinks multiculturalism is a satanic plot. And this is the guy who's being held up as the leading expert on China's policy on Uyghurs and Xinjiang in Washington. And he's being propped up by the victims of communism, which we talked about before. I mean, like anyone with, you know, any sense would look at this sort of think tank and think, man, these, these people yeah. are like bonkers, right-wing Republicans. Well, they're, they're, they're endowed by the U.S. government, though. Yeah. And they meet in the Capitol Hill basement and they have like a lot of money. And so basically, Zentz was brought over by the U.S. government to do this conference with all these U.S. government-backed Uyghur groups. And I got up in the middle of the event and asked him, you know, did you really say I, – all I said was, did you say all this shit in your book? Because that's – I mean, I didn't say it like that, but that was yeah. my mentality. It's like, so you are <laughs> – for the end times, man. Like, because if anyone's for that, you can't, I, you can't be trusted. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there you'd think after a certain amount of people are exposed like this, or uh, um, you know, there was the I don't know if you if you knew the story of uh, Ruslan Abbas. Um, yeah, she was doing yeah, an yeah. AMA on Reddit. Yeah, yeah, where she was going to say my my family is locked up in Xinjiang, and then it was exposed. She worked for Guantanamo Bay, overseeing actual Uyghur prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. And then she just canceled her AMA. She didn't ask any. She didn't answer any questions after that. Or these guys, especially from Australia. There's a lot of uh, Uyghurs in Australia posting nonstop. What they do is they 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 go farm through uh, Douyin videos, and then repost it and say, "You see, um, uh, Uyghurs are being forced to drink alcohol. Never mind, you know, Uyghurs and in Xinjiang that make been making wine for a thousand years." And you would think after a certain number of liars or a certain number of shady characters are exposed, people will start questioning this kind of a number. But as you said, um, there are legitimate problems. Like when Uyghurs, especially because there was a legitimate terrorism problem. So when Uyghurs travel around China, they are subjected to a lot more tests, like checks, like they'll check their documents more or, you know, police will show up at the hotel, find out where they came from, where they're going from. And that's just something that's the way they solve issues here. It's not right. I mean, even uh, during COVID-19, foreigners became risky here because it was like China had their shit together with uh, COVID-19. And then um, it was they were scared of what was happening overseas. So when we were traveling around, there were a lot of hotels that refused us or things like that. Um, even in Chengdu now, I had to argue with the hotel. I said, what are you talking about? I said, foreigners haven't been allowed in China for two, three months. Obviously, I've been here for a long time. Um, and it's just how they deal with problems. It's uh, not right, but how you go from that to uh, trying to ethnically cleanse their ethnic minorities when the ethnic minorities were never even subjected to the one-child policy, when they've got all kinds of additional benefits and all this kind of stuff, you would think that people would start to um, ask questions. But this is something that people just really want to believe. And I would yeah. imagine you yeah. probably get a lot of uh, heat, because I know I do. Whenever you talk about it and say, come on, guys, think about this a little bit more logically, you get attacked big time. You're saying, how dare yeah, yeah. you, you know, you yeah, Holocaust denier deny or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's just you, you can't really make any ground with that. I, I wonder I, that that almost makes me think, too. I wonder if you hits ever hit certain topics where, you know, you say that, you know what? This, there's something here to talk about. There's an issue here, but I'm not going to cover it because it's just nobody's ready to listen. So I, I know you covered even North Korea in your NED documentary. I visited North Korea, uh, what was it? It was like uh, six years ago, seven years ago. And there were a lot of interesting things I saw there, uh, but I didn't really talk about it too much because I'm like, you know, I, people are just going to be, you know, uh, attacking me for this. So they're not ready to listen for, to anything I saw. Uh, do you ever run across topics like this saying, you know, I'm going to leave this one alone. It's not even worth it. Or do you just, is everything fair game? You go after anything that looks like a, 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 there's a misinformation campaign on, do you know what I mean? I mean, I, I, what we aim to do is help people unpack misinformation campaigns that are driving conflict and hostility and war, uh, as well as, uh, I think, uh, whitewashing systems of, oppression or systems of exploitation. I mean, the capitalist system ex itself relies on so many um, uh, public relations campaigns. Right. Uh, I'm working on a story right now about how, you know, the environmental movement is, you know, some 
components of it, what you would call big green, some of the big green organizations are just basically greenwashing Wall Street and these elite foundations um, and basically duping liberals into many wealthy liberals into this divestment campaign where they divest of uh, their, of, uh, they think they're divesting of fossil fuels and they're putting money into investment funds that just play this shell game where they invest their money instead of coal, they put it in mining and oil and gas infrastructure and plastics. It's just like an absurd joke. And you have some of the major environmental groups promoting those very investment funds. So uh, there's, there's just a, a constant stream of deception and misinformation and people really either appreciate us or hate us for it. You know, the people who tried to, and the interest that tried to prevent my book tour from taking place were the ones exposed in my book. So I said, it's just like the tobacco lobby trying to stop a book about, uh, you know, in cigarettes with secretly enhanced nicotine or the harmful effects of cigarettes on lungs, you know, that's what we're facing. So when it comes to China, it's much harder to tell that story and to bust open the the propaganda unless you really have your uh, case, unless you're right. really solid. So re yeah. So really, your kind of area of focus is uh, taking apart any misinformation, uh, primarily focusing on anything that has the likelihood of creating conflict. Really. Yeah, I mean, like, and in, in the U.S. is the primary force in the world that's an aggressor that is creating these conflicts, that has an interest in dominating uh, realms of space, geopolitical uh, spheres that are thousands of miles away. Whereas with China or Russia, they'll commit you know, human rights abuses or dominate a smaller country on their frontiers in order to protect their strategic depth. But the U.S. considers the entire globe its strategic right. Yeah, so we're operating within the belly of the beast and we're exposing all of these propaganda and, and so many of the propaganda constructs relate to human rights. The whole concept of human rights was conceived, um, not all of it, but it was weaponized initially as a political force against the Soviet Union. So we see that um, concept being constantly repurposed by the U.S. And so the attacks on us are that we're against human rights when these, uh, you know, the, the, the net effect of these hostile campaigns is much more damaging to human rights than whatever the allegation relates to. With China, yeah. it's much more, I was just going to say, with China, it's more difficult because people in the U.S. know so much less about China. Their concept of it is so much more cartoonish than even Russia. Mm, it is, yeah. There is a much more substantial slice of the country that's sympathetic to at least some part of the Russian population than the Chinese population. And uh, so it's much tougher to take these on. And you really yeah. don't know what you're so, doing. So there, there, there was an active effort to uh, try to stop your book from being published, as I, as I understand it. And um, what that makes me think of also is because I saw you go on to a CGTN interview and at the beginning of the interview, you said, uh, you know, I just want to be clear. This was during the whole uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, you know, uh, yeah. lab made virus uh, story that uh, Pompeo was pushing and he's since backed away from because he was asked some pretty direct questions and it looked like he was pretty embarrassed that he couldn't even, you know, uh, answer yeah. in the most basic way. But when you wanted to tear that apart, and you did an, a pretty good article on it also, um, none of the Western media really wanted to talk to you about it. And so when you got on that CGTN interview, Chinese state media, you said, I just want to be clear, I'm here. Um, and, and one of the reasons is because none of my own media wants to talk to me. <laughs> so there, there does still seem like there is kind of an effort to just you know uh, shut down things that aren't really fitting the narrative that they want to push at that particular moment. Because hating on China seems to be a pretty bipartisan thing. So definitely, wh I mean, w what we pointed out in the piece, me and Ajit, were, was that you know Pompeo's basically the State Department went about it in a clever way after going about it in a really crude way. It first started as this ridiculous. Um, deception about a bioweapon being spun out of the Wuhan Institutes of Virology. And it was um, planted in the Washington Times, which is a right-wing paper run by the South Korean 
um, unification church cult of, of Sun Young Moon, which is always tied in with like the right wing intelligence forces there. So it just didn't wash. But then months later, they came back and planted a story with this neocon columnist at the Washington Post, Josh Rogan, and liberals were sharing it. I mean, you had Chris Hayes sharing it on Twitter and all these people like, wow, maybe it is true. Maybe this is it. And it wasn't. And the story was just so full of holes. One thing we pointed to, since you brought up the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, this guy that Rogan quoted, kept quoting in the article as a research scientist, like someone you think of who's actually like working with beakers in a lab and is a virologist, he turned out to be just a, um, a computer scientist who was a National Endowment for Democracy fellow who was a Chinese exile. And his job was just like doing propaganda against China from within a university. So the whole thing was just a fraud from top to bottom. And you would think somebody else in US media would think to do this. I mean, the Trump administration is pushing a new version of the WMD lie. Right. No one did it. They just, they, they fell for it. And that shows you what we're up against here. I mean, as much hatred as there is for Trump, he's Hitler, you know, he's this evil orange man. They fall for his propaganda again and again and again, and they won't touch our work on it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm actually curious in terms of the CGTN interview, I'm guessing not much of the foreign a foreign audience would have would have seen it maybe a bit. But were you were you were you happy with how that interview turned out? Because I've got a story. Uh, uh, you, were you Did you watch it after and you thought they represented what you wanted to say quite well? I, I think so. I mean, unless I missed something and I think it did pretty well. It got like 80. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's fine. Now, the reason I'm asking is because it's it's one of the frustrating things is, is that there isn't this environment um, that's conducive to truth telling because there, there was a uh, there was a mayor of uh, Belleville, uh, New Jersey, uh, Michael Melham. He was extremely sick. I think it was in November or December. And then he got his antibodies tested. And it turns out he has COVID, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the antibodies, meaning he had this virus before. And he said he really wanted to get to the bottom of the truth. And so first of all, as he started speaking out, saying that I think this virus was here in America a lot earlier, he got hate from that already. Uh, apparently, he has a lot of people in his town who have been saying the same thing, that they thought they had it earlier. But none of the media wanted to talk to him. So he went to CGTN also. And um, I uh, I had been asking him some questions on Twitter. And I, I told him, I said, hey, you know what? Uh, you're, you're, I don't think you're going to be seen very well for doing this. And I said, I saw, you know, Max Blumenthal did a, a, an interview on CGTN and I liked his approach where he specifically said up front, uh, the reason I'm here is because none of our, my, our own media wants to pick this up. Uh, but in the end, what he did, I think he wanted to stay balanced. So during the interview, he uh, apparently said a lot of negative stuff about China too, like certain things, like he questioning the numbers and stuff. But then they, they, they cut all of those pieces out and just focused on the pieces where he's saying that this was uh, probably in New Jersey a lot earlier. And it, he was basically turned into almost like a propaganda piece, which was so unfortunate. And he can't win either way. So here he is. He's so interested in getting this truth out. And he's just been shut up by both sides. I was kind of I was kind of annoyed at CGTN for that also. I've been interviewed by CGTN before and I sent the person I know there. I said, this is this is like not a good thing, but I'm glad your one uh, turned out uh, OK. But it does it does yeah, seem I mean, that I don't, there was I don't need to you know do the respectability politics because people who hate china already hate me and they're, it's just <laughs> that's true different. that's a good point he's got more to lose he's got more to lose in that regard we've already <laughs> lost that years ago so it doesn't yeah matter. But, you know the global times uh i did an interview with global times which is another chinese outlet it's more market-based than cgtn it's not just like this government Paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. They do some. They go. Uh, they go a little bit off, further off script, uh, even more so. But um, I just want a, a quick couple things, a curiosity things about your NED documentary uh, before we wrap up. Yeah. There was, um, there were some. Uh, I remember there were some instances towards the end where uh, you saw, for example, there was a guy. Uh, I think it was Carl uh, Gershman, and you were asking him if um, if he you could speak to him. And the only thing he said to you was, he said, are you Sydney's son? I know about you. And then he walked off and, and he didn't want to talk to you. What, 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 was, what was that about? Like, I, I don't really know too much about your, your history and stuff like that. But why was that? Or do you just have a reputation where people know I'm not going to talk to this guy? Yeah, well, they must have, it must have got around, you know, Sydney's son is crazy. He's like challenging <laughs> us and he, he supports like he supports like Putin and, and, and dictators or who knows what. Or he, he hates Israel, you know that stuff gets around in Washington. 
Um, uh, uh, yeah, it was Andy was, Card also, right? Andy that? Card, Andy just that Andy they said somebody, somebody Bush rescued him. Yeah, Andy Card was, um, I was, he was about to go down. Uh, so it's good that he got rescued. And I, it wasn't that I was going to say anything. Um, in particular, he was just exposing how little he knew about any of these issues and what a figurehead he was. Um, but Gershman, I mean, that guy uh, dealt has dealt with every administration since Reagan. Um, he's the sort of dictator for life of the National Endowment for Democracy, the dear leader. So, you know, he knows everyone in Washington and he had probably heard about me and said, you know, and it told himself to, to stay the hell away from this guy. He's going to. I wound up kind of walking down the hall with him and I asked him a few questions and he refused to speak to me and was pretending I wasn't there. And I just think, you know, if you believe so much in, in democracy and promoting democracy, you'd be more confident about the programs you run, but this isn't about promoting democracy. It's about. No. Yeah. It's not, it's not. Um, yeah, that was interesting. I, I like the one, uh, I guess Nancy Pelosi didn't know uh, uh, well enough not to speak to you because you managed to catch her in the hall and she didn't really have, um, yeah. it didn't seem like she had a much of an understanding that was going on. And I think if I remember correctly, she was saying on stage that she saw people executed in the streets or something like that. Or I, I can't, yeah. <laughs> in North Korea. About, having visited North Korea and seeing people uh, beg her for corn cobs and people just being slaughtered in the streets. Uh, she also, uh, I, I didn't include it, but she said, Andy Card, uh, you worked for George Bush. He was a great president, great president. I'm like, this is the opposition leader. I mean, this is ridiculous. Um, <laughs> I, I would love to see her now. You know, everybody's hiding. She's at her like, you know, stately mansion in San Francisco with a case, like a freezer full of fancy ice, ice cream. cream. Like nobody's <laughs> here in Washington. You can't confront the, like my the whole reason I'm here. You know, my family's here, and I grew up here and. You know, I have like a okay living situation, but I mean, I can get to Capitol Hill in 10 minutes and these members of Congress will just be walking to votes and you can just go ask them anything or you can just go into a think tank. And besides the fact that they have like, okay, you know, free food platters, you can just get up and ask these fellows who are really making the foreign policy sausage anything you want and none of them have any answers. And it just, it's just looks beautiful on camera. So if if I saw Pelosi again, I would just say, you know, do you stand by Juan Guaido after his latest episode of a military coup where he hired these uh, mercenaries from the U.S. to invade Venezuela and they're captured by fishermen? Like, do you stand by this? And, you know, she never gets asked that by the press corps here. Yeah. It's amazing. These are like basic questions you would think they'd be asked and nobody does it. So it, it just creates such an opportunity. For someone like me and so again so many people out there like yourself and they, they they want they want these questions to be asked and i think that's the most democratic thing you can do but i get accused you, of you know supporting dictatorships or something yeah it's supposed to be what you'll be able to do but i mean are you going to get to the point where you're you're not going to be um invited into these kinds of ned conferences anymore and you're gonna have to wear disguises or anything like that i mean it seems like I mean, you know I'm after a certain surprised. point I'm polite, you know, so, but I, I think, you know, I have been prevented from entering some of these events. And sometimes what they'll say is, uh, you know, it, it, we're all booked up, but it's too full. Um, or I'll get, you know, my registration pulled when I get there. But for the most part, you know, we've been able to, I've been able to continue to go to events and um, there's an, you know, if you're watching this, look up. Uh, online for um I, I wasn't really involved in the confrontation i was there and i was filming it but look on my twitter account search my name in like elliot abrams um a group of activists in dc in went to a, a talk elliot abrams did i think at johns hopkins sice which is like this neoconservative training mill uh right in downtown dc by dupont circle and Elliot Abrams is like, you know, he has a history of being involved in basically genocide at El Mosote in, in El Salvador, Iran-Contra, coups in Palestine. And he's back in the State Department uh, guiding this policy of economic terror against Venezuela. He gets up on stage 
And there's basically no one there except for like two students who admire him for some reason. And the rest of the room are like activists who are there to hold his feet to the fire and basically, uh, I mean, just go off on him for the monstrosity he's committed to basically say, what are you doing in public? Why aren't you in jail? And that was an amazing moment of just seeing Elliot Abrams have to sit there and hear about the, I mean, his talk was taken over with a teach-in about the crimes that he'd been involved in. That kind of thing is really only possible in DC. Um, And honestly, I think like it's more powerful than, uh, it's as powerful as tearing down a statue from the past is to actually confront the current people who are right. in projecting white supremacy and oligarchy around the world and to hold them accountable. Like I prefer, I, I don't do it, you know, violent. I don't believe in, you know, it should be done violently that they should have blood poured on them. They just need to be confronted with what they've done with their own record because they can't, they have, they have nothing to say back. Right. So actually, speaking of that, speaking of your um, uh, respect for nonviolence, um, speaking of how you've been, it uh, seemed to be silent, they're trying to silence you in terms of not allowing your, well, trying to block your book and nobody wanting to listen to you on uh, debunking Pompeo's kind of uh, lab made virus thing. The other thing that happened, right, was, and not many, not much media covered this also. I think Rolling Stones covered it, but you were arrested under very suspicious circumstances and it was put you, that you were armed and dangerous, which only shows up, I think you said, on 2% of arrest warrants. Yep. And you don't really uh, 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 seem like a, an armed and uh, dangerous person to me, but... Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Like what happened um, and, and, and what's going on with it? Uh, because I'm sure you, hopefully you have some updates for now. Hopefully you've got some positive movements on that. Well, the charges were dropped a uh, few weeks after I was arrested in uh, October. But I was arrested five months after I committed the horrible uh, atrocity of delivering food to people and, and sanitary supplies to people inside the Venezuelan embassy who were protesting an attempt to take it over by the illegal criminal white collar mafia of Juan Guaido. Um, and the embassy was surrounded by these hooligans, these violent right wing hooligans who were just truly violent and racist and homophobic who were associated with the Venezuelan opposition. They were part of the Venezuelan diaspora here in the Washington area. And they were being used as a proxy force by the Secret Service, you know, the the police of the State Department to do what they were not legally allowed to do, which was to attack us and try to wage this psychological war on the people inside the embassy. And so uh, when we delivered the food, it was actually us who were attacked. I didn't come into physical contact with anyone. And then they found some 59 year old woman I'd never met before. Um, and, uh, you know, there's video all over the place of her attacking people all that the, the whole day before, just someone who's clearly unhinged. And, you know, she alleged that I brutally beaten her with some other guys and that we threw her against the wall and need her and she was fighting for her life. She completely lied. The whole thing was a lie. Nothing happened to me, though. One person who was with me, Ben Rubenstein, he was arrested the next day because he showed up at the protest. But beyond that. No one came to my house and arrested me. They could have come at any point. I went in and out of the country. I even went to Syria and came back and I was never arrested. There was no warrant. And for whatever reason, the warrant was authorized five months later and I was listed as armed and dangerous. And I woke up one morning with my house surrounded by police, them demanding to come in and saying they're going to break down my door. And then I was thrown, I mean, I was thrown in jail for two days because I was one of the first people in. I was the first person in jail that day and the last person out like 48 hours later. Um, and it was not a pleasant place to be. I'm sure at this wow. point. Wow. Yeah, cool. that's, well, that, that, I mean, that's quite an experience um, in an interesting way that it's a new method. <laughs> methodology for trying to silence you but it's good to hear that that's all uh, i mean i guess they didn't really have a case did they so i really wish that i could you know there i could strike back somehow and 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 seek some kind of legal recourse but it just i'm not sure if that's going to be possible i was just lied about the dc police made no effort to investigate this I, i would like to you know find out how that warrant got authorized but 
you know, all the power is on their side. All the resources are on their side. I'm not going to be able to pay for some lawyer for months and months. And yeah, it, it doesn't seem right because, I mean, there should be a deterrent for uh, for people who are willing to or want to uh, misuse the system like this just to kind of uh, 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 silence somebody or get back at somebody um, under these kinds of false pretenses. There should be some kind of uh, consequences for them doing that. But yeah, I mean, at least that... Then you saw just like a who's who of all of these sort of State Department leftists and blue checkmark neocons and think tankers and foreign policies, China correspondent, uh, uh, James Palmer. He uh, they were all celebrating my arrest and, and insisting that I was guilty, that I must have beaten up an old woman. They were just so happy. And it just shows how much they believe in democracy themselves. I mean, they just want to see their enemies silenced and jailed. They're, they're perceived enemies. Um, right. That, I mean, what's the answer to that? How do you how do you get back at that? Like, what can you do to them? Like, pretty much, you just have to endure. Uh, but it really, uh, I thought, you know, in some ways, it exposed how uh, unfair this whole system is and for a lot of people who hadn't been looking at it closely enough. And for me... I mean, I live in Ward 8 in D.C. It's the poorest district in the city. It's mono, It's the most monolithically black. Um, and, you know, I know what goes on here and I grew up in this city, but to see it from inside the jail um, and to really get to spend time with guys who are like my neighbors who are just jailed constantly in and out for the most absurd minor charges, basically for being poor. And seeing the kind of uh, the ringer they're constantly put through in this system, right? Until yeah. they, you know they get ankle bracelets and they have to walk around with ankle bracelets. One guy held up his bracelet and was like, "This is modern day slavery. What do you think this is? This is just the new chains." Um, and then they get put in you know maximum security prisons. Uh, eventually, uh, it really opens your eyes to what uh, just millions of people who are totally voiceless um and yeah who are being basically used as slave labor in prisons and i think it informs the current protest moment in the u.s hopefully this movement will um kind of get a conversation an important conversation going but what i'm curious about in terms of what happened to you um with your book and everything like that and considering what's what goes on around the world with uh obviously with, you know, Julian Assange, who was essentially just a journalist as well. Do you ever worry about eventually crossing a certain line uh, where you're going to be targeted even more or put yourself at, uh, at risk even more? Um, does that ever cross your mind or do you think you're, you're still pretty, pretty safe in that regard? I mean, being arrested isn't the only abuse of the legal system against me or the gray zone. Um, there's lawfare efforts that are ongoing against us, uh, which are coordinated uh, I believe there's a coordinated effort to get me and everyone associated with the gray zone uh, investigated by the FBI to get us jailed under the Espionage Act to use Assange as a precedent. Um, that's really all I can say for now, but I'll hopefully have a chance to expose a lot of this in the future. Um, but the Trump era has really caused a huge degeneration in whatever veneer of sort of civil liberties and democracy that existed in the U S and so it's real. Um, and, and it is a concern, but everything we do is in the open and all we do is journalism. Yeah. So I, I shouldn't have anything to be concerned about. Right. And um, so I on that note, that, you, oh. you, what's that? You just got to keep going and let the chips yeah. fall. Away. Yeah. Um, and in terms of that, in terms of what's happened under Trump and everything like that, um, do you um, have any, uh, I mean, it's a sad state of democracy when the choices are basically Trump or Biden. I mean, it's, um, uh, it's unfortunate that it's come down to this. Do you have any uh, predictions or hopes or ideas of what you think might happen? Um, or that's something you don't touch because it's just so it's just up in the air so much. Yeah, just to be, uh, to, just to clarify that the, the forces that I think really are trying to suppress my journalism uh, would be like, they're, they're, they're more in the center. They're more like anti-Trump centrist forces that actually hate the left and hate anti-imperialists more than Trump. 
and they tried to associate me with Trump somehow with this phony brown red alliance. So they say, you know, because Trump retweeted me, he eventually unretweeted yeah, me. Like, that's right, yeah. But because of that, it proves some brown red alliance. Like I actually went to Donald Trump and said, "Can you tweet this?" Because we both hate John Bolton. Like that's like a pretty, you know, fine. That's a point of agreement between me and Trump. John Bolton's an enemy of all living things. Whatever. It doesn't prove that I'm a fascist, but that's what that's the kind of alliance they try to create in people's imaginations. Um, but to your to your question about, yeah, it's a sad moment. I feel like the protests and all the focus on that has kind of provided a diversion from the constant horse race politics. And then you have the, well, the, the, the coronavirus lockdown ending. So we're now on an upward curve again, just because the country got bored of being under lockdown. Um, they're just kind of throwing in the towel. The, I've never been in an election period like this where so little interest has been dedicated by the press to the horse race itself. And it's because the country mm. is really just coming apart at the seams. Um, and they have so much to report on as a result. Uh, it, it is it is concerning. You know, there in, in China, uh, there was a Bloomberg article that talked about how um, the Chinese government is warming up to the idea of Trump, uh, you know, four more years of Trump. And they, um, they put it down to this idea that China knows that the uh, Trump has the highest chance of being a, a catalyst or a reason to accelerate uh, the, the downfall of uh, America. And whether that's true or not in terms of that's what, uh, you know, the, the Chinese government thinks, I don't know. But I can tell you on the ground from ordinary Chinese people, a lot of them really like the idea of four more years of Trump. Um, it's kind of it, it's made the people here a lot more unified. Um, you know, the people here, uh, there were a lot of people here who really respected Western democratic systems and they understood um, like there was some, you know, that he's known, recognized as the founder of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew. He was talking about needing to get your society educated to a certain level before you can even think about democracy because you imagine people kind of, you know, illiterate trying to choose who, who the best leader is. And you, uh, you can't really make that argument anymore. The soci society here is really educated, but they're looking at America and saying, what happens with an educated society with democracy? Well, you could end up with a choice between, you know, Trump and Hillary and now Trump and Biden. And you, um, uh, 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 you, you end up with a, a president like you have. So it's made them a little bit more confident about their system. The attacks from the U.S. have made them more unified also, uh, because throughout Chinese history, the times that China has been the most unified is when there's a common enemy. And right. they're kind of being attacked by a lot of this propaganda from overseas. Then obviously the other thing too is, is when China's going around with their Belt and Road Initiative and they're trying to convince places to um, uh, cooperate with them, and then you've got Pompeo coming in behind, uh, you know, threatening Israel, threatening Victoria, Australia, saying don't join the BRI or else your relationship with us is going to be at risk. Um, China looks a lot more attractive to do business with uh, than had America had um, a little bit more of a stable, uh, stable president. Uh, you know, they're more likely to, to look at this and say, why are you telling us not to do business with China? And then, of course, uh, they have the benefit here where they know that they're not just going to walk away from a deal for four years later because there's a new administration like uh, with America walking away from, you know, JCO JCOP or these different things. So on the ground here, a lot of people are uh, hoping that Trump is going to win. And they're also a little bit annoyed that I'm giving away the secret <laughs> that a lot yeah. of them support. Uh, I mean, support. It, makes, it makes sense. And, you know. It, it, it really does make sense. Trump has yeah. weakened the U.S. on the world stage uh, and that, you know, the weaker the U.S. is on the world stage tends to be better for humanity, for the people who've been under the U.S.'s boot. Um, I, I know Palestinian intellectuals would always say to me, you know, we're never going to be free of this occupation and this whole project of apartheid until the U.S. is weakened enough to pull out and Donald Trump, I mean, he's lifted the mask on Israel as well. He said, you want apartheid? All right, go annex all the settlements. Just forget about the two-state solution. And that was really the mask that enabled the creation of the settlements under, on the, under the guise of democracy. You know, there's eventually going to be a peace process. So let's not sanction Israel. Now, all of the, everything is in place now for Israel to be sanctioned. And so while, um, Palestinians are under just brutal pressure. 
at the same time, Israel has just set itself up for its complete delegitimization on the world stage. And uh, I think people around the world understand that with Trump. With Biden, you know, the Democrats are tend to, they tend to be the more uh, the smarter imperialists. The Republicans traditionally are the stupid party. It's not new with Trump. Yeah, um, I mean, particularly with Trump. I mean, even um, what was it? Assad said that he uh, Trump is the best president that they could ever wish for because he's transparent. He says exactly what he wants. He says he's coming here for the oil. He's going to, you know, take the oil, and he says, you know, exactly what he wants. But the other thing too is, is he's just not he's not making any friends anywhere. Um, everything he does, it's not like um, when he's say, uh, you know, attacking China, he's trying to build an alliance, build uh, uh, friends around the world. He's just like breaking relationships all over the place. You know, there were issues with uh, the U.S. stealing uh, PPE shipments from other people. Um, yeah. You know, the the the, the tariffs um, that they put on China. Uh, now Chinese factories will just go to Vietnam and open up their, uh, Chinese companies will go there to open up their factories. And all of a sudden the relationship um, between China and Vietnam will improve. You know, they had some issues before, but now it's going to become better and better because of Trump. Everything he's doing is um, basically basically is putting China in a pretty good position. Um, so, and like you said, it kind of the U.S. Yeah. is just I, it's a really bad place to be right now. Uh, culturally, economically, it's pretty catastrophic. Uh, I think this was inevitable. Trump was just sort of the accelerationist option. And I, I, I do talk to people around the country. I don't share the view, but they were Bernie supporters. And they tell me they'd rather have uh, Trump win than Biden just because they despise that wing of the Democratic Party that's crushed their hope so much and just prevented democracy within the Democratic Party. They think it just serves them right. Um, but I, I don't think the odds are in Trump's favor right now. I mean, no one even talks about Biden. Biden barely exists in the American conscience consciousness uh he's sort of hiding in some po box in delaware somewhere he, no one pays it he'll release a video or do a live and it gets less views than this will probably get and that's yeah good Biden, um, not only because he's in early stage dementia and that he's always been sort of an odious right-wing democratic politician but because this is this election is just simply a referendum on Trump. And I think Trump has brought so much instability that sectors of the population that really can't handle that instability are going to turn out against him. And they'll swing states like Michigan that Trump won, that he really uh, won by very narrow margins where Hillary Clinton didn't even campaign. I'm talking about like the baby boomers, people in their early and mid seventies who are now stuck at home and can't take the risk of getting COVID. Uh, they feel totally betrayed. Uh, a lot of the workers, uh, the white workers who voted for Trump, some of them took a chance on him because, you know, it was Bill Clinton who did NAFTA. It was Obama who did TPP. And, you know, Trump was a different kind of Republican than the corporate George W. Bush. So they thought he's going to bring the jobs back. He said he would, and he hasn't. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, no matter, yeah, no matter what happens, uh, who gets elected, um, it does certainly look quite concerning in the short term. Um, you know, I think America needs a, a, a really big overhaul. And it's such a pity to see what's going on because it's such a great country. It's such a beautiful country. I've got lots of family also. Well, like you hearing are. stories. I mean, you chose uh, to leave. What's that? Well, you, you're not here for a reason, apparently. <laughs> well, I, I'm actually Canadian. So I, 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 I you know. And uh, we've annexed Canada. It's the same yeah. thing. <laughs> but uh, I, I used to go to New York City every uh, every year. Um, uh, my mom is from uh, Guyana, um, which has an interesting story. We, we should talk about another time, which also had a CIA situation that really messed up their country um, with, with when Chetty Jagan was a bit too friendly with the Soviet Union. But anyways, on to the main point. In uh, New York, there's a huge Guyanese community, and they've been hit really hard by uh, COVID-19. Uh, my aunt is still in the hospital after over two months. And just hearing the story of when she was picked up, um, she... Um, she thought it was her vertigo at first when she realized it was more serious. She could barely walk, um, but the ambulance showed up, brought her down from, um, I think she's on the second or third floor. She, no stretcher. She had to walk down by herself. When she got in the ambulance, she wanted to lie down on the bed. And they said, no, 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 don't, don't lie there. It's dirty. 
then she sat on the metal bench and then she wanted to lie sideways on the metal bench because she couldn't hold herself up anymore. And they yelled at her, said, no, you can't do that. You have to sit up. And it was just like, and then there was no meaningful contract contact tracing. They didn't cordon off her building or anything like that, which is a huge difference from what we experienced here in China. I've been here on the ground for the entire thing. And I just thought, this is not America. This is not supposed to be America. America is supposed to be way more great than this. Um, and I just, I just hope there's a way, uh, there's, a, I hope there's a way to fix it. But I mean, with the current candidates, it just doesn't look like anything meaningful is going to happen in the short term. I always said that, uh, you know, the system that the U S tried to export at the barrel of a gun, uh, which wound up causing millions of excess deaths in Russia in the nineties, uh, which has devastated parts of Mexico and Latin America, um, sub-Saharan Africa, Iraq, that system has always been here with us. And now we're just experiencing its effects in a way we really haven't before. Yeah. So, so that's, that's a good point. So when, when I say, um, I almost use the phrase without saying make America great again, but to truly make America great again, um, domestically without all of that foreign, uh, without those foreign elements i mean in my mother's country what they did was they basically rallied up the two main ethnic uh, populations of african descent and indian descent um and, and basically started a racial war between them and it's gotten a lot better now but you know 50 60 years later whatever it is uh, that 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 uh, racism that was stoked by um the cia and mi5 those documents are already declassified um still has lasting effects until today and knowing that story very well and hearing how, you know, uh, my grandmother's generation talks about the other ethnic group, which is pretty, uh, you know, appalling. And it's just kind of ingrained into their system now. I honestly, I can't help but think um, when I was looking at what was going on in Hong Kong, it was exactly the same thing that was happening with this anti-mainlander sentiment. And you've got people like Jimmy Lai publishing things, calling, um, uh, calling mainlanders locusts and things like that. And you've got you know, mainlanders, if they're speaking Mandarin in the streets, getting beaten up and nobody really meaningful standing up against it, saying we should stop doing this. It feels like I'm witnessing what it must have been like in Guyana during that time when there was something deliberately being kind of uh, riled up between two groups of people. That's, uh, you know, we don't have the benefit of declassified documents on that yet, but we know that that's exactly what they did elsewhere. And they could have just dusted off an old uh, playbook. But um, classic colonial trick of divide and conquer. The Belgians did it with the uh, Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda. Um, the FBI did it with, um, you know, the young lords or in Chicago, the disciples and vice lords, when they wanted to have a treaty, they would send uh, poison pen letters, fake letters from one leader to the other to create divisions. Uh, they did that the same thing with the West coast and East coast leadership of the black Panthers. I mean, every colonized group has experienced that division every time they try to yeah. get out from the booth they're under. So it's, you know, it's important to have a personal connection to it as well. It really opens up a lot of, uh, it's a really important prison to see the prism to see the world through within the Palestinian polity. It's Hamas versus Fatah. That's a division that Israel has just aggressively tried to encourage, even by funding Hamas. Mm, yeah, it looks like it's something that goes on all around. Um, and uh, so, you know what? We better, we've been going on for about an hour and a half. I know I've taken yeah. up a lot of time here, but I, I owed you extra time because <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. But um, let's uh, finish off maybe with uh, figuring out, finding out what you're working on. What's next for you? Uh, you know, any few future books or what, what are the main topics that you're going to be working on over the next little while? Well, I talked about one of the pieces I was working on about the kind of, um, it, it's really about the censorship of this film, uh, Planet of the Humans that Michael Moore has served as executive producer on, which I think might've had some flaws in it, but really exposed in a way no film has to this point, no documentary has, how the environmental movement has been taken over by neoliberal capitalists. And so my piece is about the censorship campaign. I hate censorship campaigns, the campaign to drive that film tem temporarily off the internet, on uh, who is behind it and who's behind them. Um, it's been fascinating for me to learn about how the environmental movement has been co-opted by billionaires, something I hadn't worked on previously. 
I have a lot of uh, other projects that I want to finish and need to finish. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm also working on a piece that should be out soon. It probably would have been out if I hadn't done this interview. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's important to, to uh, yeah. it's important for me to, you know, have these kind of engagements, but uh, about the Caesar sanctions that have been just applied to Syria, uh, which really aim to cause a famine in Syria in order to encourage regime change and how these sanctions were the product of a, Caesar is this Syrian uh, so-called so whistleblower who supposedly smuggled 50,000 photographs of people who'd been murdered by the regime out and how this was just a gigantic intelligence fraud. Um, so that should be out soon. And, uh, you know, the, the gray zone is constantly growing. I think we're bringing in more and more contributors, a bigger audience, and we have a uh, you know, two regular shows, um, push back with Anya Parampil, who's downstairs. She's my wife and, uh, not push back red lines with Anya Parampil and, uh, push back with Aaron Mate. Um, I think you should definitely have both of them on and, okay. uh, yeah. and yeah, and Ben Norton, who's our assistant editor. He's in Nicaragua right now. He's been documenting the situation there, which is really in flux because the U S is deepening its economic war on Nicaragua. We always try to report, you know, from inside, but also on the other side of the story. So yeah. I, you know, I'm just managing this, this site and uh, it's, it's really exciting to be a part of a part of an ind totally independent site um, to have founded it and to see so much um, to, to see it get so much, um, attention and um, interest it really feels like my obligation right now is just to keep the site hot on a daily basis um, yeah so yeah that's going to be good I'm, I'm really looking forward to those uh, pieces also on the censorship and then particularly speaking on sanctions I think people really need to learn more about what those are really about and who really gets affected I mean it was just it, not too long ago right the U.S. put sanctions on a Mexican company for sending drinking water to Venezuela right. I believe it was or yeah. or or yeah um, yeah, I mean, that, that they they're aiming to starve people in Venezuela, in Iran, yeah. in Syria. And yeah. No one here in the U.S. understands it because there aren't American kids coming back in body bags like they were from from Iraq. Um, yeah. And then on and there's a there's another project that I was kind of working on, which is uh, a sports podcast. I'm I'm not directly involved in it, but. You know, I was helping kind of as a side producer, and it's a friend of mine named Nathaniel Wallace, who was, you know, former Division One football player who got into activism. I met him because he became the Students for Justice in Palestine chapter president at uh, Florida State when they hosted me. And I thought, this is a really remarkable character. He has all these, you know, deep football connections. You walk around a tailgate party with him at any NFL game, and he can talk to anyone there about people who came out of their town and went into the NCAA. Um, and he's a serious leftist um, who really sees sports from kind of a Marxist standpoint. And so I said, you know, it could be a really important teaching tool, especially now to do a podcast on sports and analyze sports, um, how class and race are playing out. I think sports is really one of the most like professional sports right now is one of the major sites of resistance uh, to the system of neoliberal capitalism. Um, and athletes are really taking the lead right now and refusing to participate and entertain people who tell them to just shut up and play without serious structural changes. I think that's one of the most interesting things happening in the U.S. right now. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, the yeah, the, what was it? It was literally somebody told LeBron James right to shut up and dribble, right? Yeah. And then, and then later on, um, they demanded with this kind of McCarthyism uh, witch hunt, they were demanding that he had an opinion on Hong Kong, and the, a sim an a an answer as simple as I don't think we're informed enough on it, which is a completely reasonable, not only a reasonable statement, the understatement of a century, and he was just blasted for that. Now they've got pictures of him. Uh, looking like Mao Zedong on, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chinese money right. and stuff like that. It was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. But yeah, no, no, they're burning his jersey in Hong Kong and you know, all these racist comments being made about him. Yeah. Chat rooms. 
Um, yeah, Nathaniel's explored that. His podcast is called Red Spin Sports. It's a play on the racist name of the Washington football team, but it's like a red spin on sports. Um, so check that out. That'll be yeah. – it, 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 for two episodes are out, but that'll be improving. That's not on the gray zone, but I just feel like, you know, it's important to kind of uh, help create new media projects at a time when like the mainstream media, the corporate media is shrinking and the parameters for discussion are narrowing. Yeah. yeah what, what, I'll, what I'll do is after this, I'll get all the, the lists of the recommendations you made and I'll put it in the description of, uh, of this video. Cool. But, and you know, uh, I do my podcast with Ben Norton, uh, Moderate Rebels, and our next one will be about the um, two major military bases named for Confederate generals. And one of them was actually a training ground for the officer who killed George Floyd. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's going to be, and that's going to be covered on the, on a newer podcast or on the, uh, uh, your, your, your existing one. It should be up by Thursday on Thursday. On which is my okay. podcast. you know we've been doing it for like two years now yeah right right okay well let, let's wrap up there it's been going on for about an hour and a half and i know you've got a lot to do you're probably still going to be up for a while you're always sending me messages at really odd hours like 3 a.m 4 a.m your time <laughs> but uh you've probably got quite a bit more to do still so um yeah thanks a lot for 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 joining and i'll put the description i'll put all the uh, information for the the items you recommended in the description yeah. Thanks a lot. It was a really good discussion. I learned a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, we should do it again. And then when you do eventually make it over to China, come over here. This I'm sitting in my brew pub here. We're actually brewing a, a sour beer today. So come by, have a beer, and we'll talk China. Definitely. Is it possible to come over now? or Not, not yet, um, but they're starting to come up with some new systems. Um, I think they're starting. They're going to start with letting people in from Hong Kong. Uh, but it might still be it might still be a little while. But when 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 it is open, definitely uh, find your way over. I'll tell you what, when it's open, I'm gonna I'm gonna come. But I don't like sour beer, so. Oh no worries, we got we got twenty different IPAs. Do you do, do you like IPAs? IPAs? I'm, I'm I'm on my way as soon as it's possible. <laughs> what what beers? That's a good one to end on. What kinds of beers do you like to drink? What do you drink? Yeah, I, I got into IPAs living in California. I lived there for five years, and uh, it really stuck with me. Nice. Yeah, we've got, we've got, a, yeah, I like dark beer. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, we've got a stout. We've got a stout. Um, and then we've got a, uh, a because uh, I was called a, um, you know, you, you, there's an insult for people who uh, say things that are supportive of China. They, they call them 50 cents, right? Uh, because they, they say they get paid 50 cents for each post. So I have in one of my tanks now uh, a red ale. Uh, purposefully red, uh, which is going to be called our 50 cent uh, beer. We're not really going to sell for 50 cents, but it's to celebrate being called a uh, 50 cent by all of these Hong Kong kind of uh, uh, groups that have been trying to take my YouTube and Twitter down. <laughs> well, that would be the perfect beer for me to try because we just got emailed. Every Everybody at the Gray Zone just got an email from a neocon publication that spun out of NATO asking us, you know, if we're being paid secretly by China to, to do all of these <laughs> journalistic takedowns of their propaganda. So that would be the perfect beer for me. Sounds good. Sounds good. Let's make it happen. Cool. Anyways, you, you have a good night then and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll catch up next time all then. Right. Great talking, Daniel. You too.